Now that doesn't look as innocent. That looks right. a little suspicious. We're the armed attorneys. Today we are talking about how post self-defense incident related conduct can be used against you. Now stick around to the end because we have a real client story that is a perfect illustration of this, how, you know, something he did changed the complete direction of the investigation. But before we begin, show your support for the Second Amendment by hitting that like button. And we get to ask this question all the time, how can we help the show out? The best thing you can do is to share the video. We don't have a big marketing budget, but if you copy the URL, paste it on your Facebook or share it with a friend, that really helps out the channel. But to start off this conversation, we have to talk about, you know, how crimes are broken down. It's really into two key components, wouldn't you say? Sure. I mean, I think those are mens rea and actus reus, which are just the fancy lawyer terms for um, the guilty act and the guilty mind, right? And generally, you have to have both in order to make a criminal act, um, one without the other. I mean, imagine shooting someone with no intent to have shot them, like an accidental discharge. Right. Um, those generally, now there are exceptions to every rule, aren't crimes. Those are things you get sued for civilly, but, you know, accidents aren't crimes. This right. is kind of the general rule. Why not? Because you don't have that guilty mens rea. Right. And so for, you know, the act part, that's pretty easy. We can see the outcome and we can see, all right, this is what occurred. But how do we get into somebody's mind and figure out what was their intent? What did they uh, want the outcome to be in this scenario? Or what information were they processing? What information did they act on? And when we're looking at the, the mens rea, there's kind of a, a couple of parts to it. But they're looking at the before, during, and after, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And your conduct. Because, I mean, you know, you can tell law enforcement what was in your mind all day right. long. Um, you know, generally people who have committed crimes don't like to tell police that they intentionally knowingly committed crimes. Um, so lots of times we are looking at whether or not you had that guilty mind from your conduct exactly right. before, during and after the incident. Right. And so um, the way that I like to think about this is kind of is there communication related conduct and that's the, you know, rarely does someone come up and say, I'm robbing you, you know, mm -hmm. but they can you can tell based on their act and what they're saying. And, uh, but we still have these communication-based you know, information that would help us understand this person's intent. Um, so when we're going back to really what we want to talk about, which is this post-self-defense, post so we're talking after self-defense, mm -hmm. you know, what kind of things do you see sinking self-defense claims? Yeah, well, I think, again, we've got two buckets, right, right. which are words and actions. Yep. Um, words come up probably more frequently than anything else, and I see it with a lot of my clients. And it's things that, um, in their minds, are like feel really innocent, right? right? But they sound bad. Right. So um, things like, I know I messed up. Mm -hmm. I mean, you'd be shocked how many people say that when it's really a justified self-defense incident, but they've had to shoot someone and they feel like they've done something wrong. Um, I know I'm going to jail. Oh yeah, that comes up a lot. Oh yeah, and that most of the time is just a reflection of. I shot someone, I'm probably going to jail for it, right. even it, if it was justified. This community knows probably better than anybody that <laughs> if you shoot somebody in self-defense, there's a high likelihood that you go to jail. Yeah. And so that's not, it's not a falsehood to no. say that. And then one that comes up, I think, all the time is, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, and again, you have hurt someone. Um, even though that person was trying to hurt you, there are lots of us out there who over-apologize and lots of people who are like, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And they'll say it in front of the police. They'll say it on body cams. And that is often brought up as evidence of a guilty mind. Like, yeah. you knew you did something you weren't supposed to. That's why you apologized. Yes. And so, what the prosecutor will paint this as is consciousness of guilt. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really what they're trying to show. Um, so, that's kind of some self defense communication, you know, communication after self defense that we see kind of um, mango. I don't know what the right word is, but it, it muddies the water. Yeah, for sure. And the, the second one is, physical conduct after a self-defense incident and the things that we see come up frequently are you know i'd say let's say changing your clothes wash mm -hmm. wash or or you know discarding the the self-defense weapon or yeah. one that comes up frequently is hey leaving the scene of the self-defense incident now if you are let's say you're in a parking garage you get attacked you defend yourself well if you relocate to a nearby business because you don't know how many attackers there are you know there's, there's a good explanation for why you might leave the scene of a self-defense incident. But if you leave the scene of a self-defense incident and maybe you relocate to Mexico, uh, that doesn't look as innocent. That looks right. a little suspicious. Well, and I mean, there are even intermediate issues. I mean, yeah. we have a, a murder trial coming up next month in which my client left the scene. Um, he needed to feel safe. 
but he kind of drove a little further than I would have wanted him to. Yeah. Now, he also called 911. He reported it, but I guarantee it's going to come up in trial. You know, why did you drive 10 minutes down the road when three minutes would have done the job? Yep. So, and then, so you have your extreme example, one end on the other end, and then things in the middle. And this all comes up in trial. And I think that brings us to, you know, a real client story and why this, this is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had a client who justified self-defense claim all day. And, but then we come to his post-self-defense incident conduct. And what did he do, Emily? He buried the gun. Um, it is, uh, I think that's a, that's a reflection of how sort of bonkers your chemicals and your brain and your body are at that right. point. Because even, I mean, police were saying, this looks like good self-defense. But why did he do this? You right. know, and it sort of puzzled everyone. And, and I don't know that he has a good explanation for why he did it. No, and it changed yeah. the direction of the of of the investigation, to be quite honest. Yeah. But, you know, that just goes to show after you've defended yourself, the fight's not over. And that's why it's so important to speak to an attorney. Uh, but how this stuff can be used against you. I mean, it's it's not over after you've defended yourself by any means. No, but we hope you enjoyed this content. If you did hit that like button, consider subscribing, and help us fight the anti-2A algorithm by sharing this video. And we always enjoy your question and comments below. Until next time, we're the Armed Attorneys.